Does that work? It works, perfectly. So, well, th thank you very much to you for that kind of introduction and for the invitation to uh, talk about our work uh, in this lovely forum. Uh, I think it's a great initiative that uh, you organize these meetings and you take advantage of uh, everyone's take up of Zoom and so on to make sure that uh, we get to uh, get our, a good dose of metallurgy uh, regularly do, during the year. So I'll, I'll be participating go going forward for sure. Um, so I'm going to be talking about texture development during the hot forming and annealing of two-phase titanium and zirconium alloys. Um, and this is work of many people, okay? Uh, most of whom I've tried to kind of list below there. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out, but I really, I thank them very much. I, unfortunately, I spend almost no time in the lab, uh, much to their relief, I'm sure. Uh, and um, th these people actually uh, have done all the work that I'm going to present. So thank you very much to, to them. So. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, this work, most of this work, the work I'm going to present is going to, is uh, is part of the the, the Lightform grant, uh, who's uh, sponsored by EPSRC and in collaboration with Imperial College and the University of, of Cambridge. So um, titanium and zirconium alloys. So um, what Leo said he was very interested to to hear about the HCP metals, but actually uh, th these these alloys all also have a little bit of BCC in them. And especially when we forge them, they have quite a lot of BCC in them. So in a way, uh, half of you will be at home, Leo, So when, when, when I talk about them. But uh, in their application, a lot of these alloys um, have dual phase and usually they're mostly alpha, so they're mostly HCP, um, but they also have a little bit of beta. And, and the beta is quite important uh, because it helps you kind of modify the, the microstructure and it helps you tailor it in for certain applications. So for example, even though we use titanium to make uh, bits of wings on airplanes and bits of the engine in the airplane, the microstructure in the two places is going to be quite different uh, for, for reasons to do with how the, the components are light. Uh, and it's that flexibility that, that gives those, those titanium alloys, like titanium 6.4, their popularity in, um, uh, in, in, in aerospace. Uh, but they're also actually uh, used extensively in, in, uh, in nuclear power, um, uh, in particular the, the Kandu reactors in, um, in Canada, uh, they all use these uh, these alloys uh, extensively, um, and there it's the, uh, the alloy is slightly different. So zirconium and titanium are not, not the same, but actually they're both dual phase. The, the microstructure is very similar, and the texture evolution is very similar. So I'm going to talk about. So it's quite nice because it seems like there's a system there, and there's a there's a way of thinking about it that is more or less independent of the alloys, but uh, more independent about the fact that they are two phase alloys with HCP and BCC phases in them, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And and I think the important thing. To, to say at this stage that whenever you make anything out of these alloys, you need to worry about texture, right? You really do. So, I mean, here's for example, for titanium 6.4 products, um, uh, some, some fatigue data uh, in vacuum and in air. So in vacuum in particular, so B, T, B, T is, is a type of texture. So T and B, T is a type of texture. And then you see T, D and R, D are just two different directions, two rolling directions. And you can see, um, the, the, the kind of a drop off in, in, um, in fatigue uh, performance that you have would, would, would be due to texture, right? Because loading in different directions. Um, and even though some of that difference goes away uh, in air, it's still very significant, right? So you cannot, you cannot actually um, ignore texture at all just from fatigue point of view, but there's a other phenomenon, even from the elastic point of view. So, you know, that, a lot of these components are designed to deform elastically in service and to change shape. Um, and uh, you need to maintain the elastic modulus of the overall component within a certain uh, limit. And because the alpha phase is quite elastically anis anisotropic, uh, that means you have to control the texture in order to get the right performance. Um, and just to drive the point home a bit further, here, here's a very recent um, event. Uh, this, air, this airplane was flying over, over Greenland and uh, a bit of the engine fell off. Uh, when they they went they went and looked for the bit of engine in Greenland, and when they found it, and they looked in the um, uh, uh, they looked at the fracture surface and they looked at the fatigue surface, and what they found in there was a region of very strong texture. Okay, uh, so there was a, a region locally where the texture is very strong, and that's what actually initiated the the, the failure. And this is actually a, the phenomenon of a dwell fatigue, which is 
which is known, has been known for many years, but still happens. And nowadays it's still limiting the life. So it's something you need to worry about um, with titanium alloys. So we'd like to be able to control this and we like to be able to, to know how it develops so that when we're making our stuff, it comes out right. Um, but this is what tends to happen when you roll titanium, right? So this is for this is the microtexture titanium 64 after rolling. Uh, we can see the bottom surface of the of the roll plate. So this is across the full thickness, uh, and you can see that uh, the texture changes from the surface to the middle to the top. So I'm plotting here the the, the strength, the volume fraction of the different different uh, texture components, and it doesn't really matter for now which they are, but just to show that there is definitely bands of texture. Okay, so there's definitely regions where the texture kind of localizes. So that there is not just an overall texture, but there's also a micro texture that is inherent to these materials. Um, it just develops naturally. You develop, you seem to have these, um, uh, you, you seem to find it whenever you do some hot working, whether it's forging or whether it's um, uh, rolling, you always seem to see this kind of periodicity and this kind of localization. Um, and so, um, this this is an important problem that, that you know we we need to be able to, to control this and then minimize it if we possibly can. Uh, and what also happens is if you take this material and then you anneal it and you anneal it in the beta phase, so you heat it up so hot that the material goes from alpha beta to being just beta, a little bit like the steel steel heat treatment, but in this case you go from HCP to BCC, um, which you might want to do, for example, if you want to make the wing part. So if you, so if you want to make the wing part of the material, usually you want this beta heat treated material because of the texture, you end up with these very kind of strange structures. So we end up with very large prior beta grains in the middle, uh, which then transform into alpha, but still they, they look quite quite different. Um, uh, and, and if you look, and this is the prior beta texture. So what we've done is we've taken the alpha map and we've reconstructed the beta. You can see that there's a lot of texture heterogeneity in the product, which affects the life. Okay, so uh, not only it's a problem after you finish rolling, but then when you anneal it, it can become even worse and can be exacerbated by annealing. Um, and and I'm, I mentioned this particularly because often when, because the material is mostly alpha at room temperature, often when we talk about texture in titanium 6.4, we only worry about the alpha texture. But actually the beta texture can be very important because if you do a beta heat treatment like this, that's what's actually going to control what happens during beta heat treatment. Okay, so, um, and this is just a forging, just to show that this also happens in forgings. Okay, so this is a role play. Uh, and this is a forging. So th this phenomenon still happens uh, nowadays you know, when, when we're trying to make uh, titanium products and we would like to avoid it altogether. So uh, pretty simple, right? Let, let's, let's go to it. So th the issue with it is that um, like you all know, thermochemical processing is not easy, especially for these materials. So uh, to, to get good microstructure control, so to get the right microstructure, what we do is you do thermochemical processing. So we hot work this material um, uh, and we work at high temperatures, okay? So usually where alpha beta volume fractions are similar, about 50-50, often we go into the beta phase for a little bit and then we come down again. Um, uh, but, you know, you can imagine these are big, big components. All the processes are incremental. Um, if you can put it, keep enough heat in the material, it's fine, but very often you have to take it back. You have to do a reheat. Uh, so the temperature is always changing, which means the phase fractions are always changing, etc. cetera. Um, and not only that, when you do a forging, for example, all those conditions vary as a function of position in the piece, right? The temperature, the strain rate, um, and so on. So you can imagine that controlling the microstructure is really not easy, um, even if you know what's going on. Uh, but the other thing is we don't really know what's going on, uh, not, not, not exactly. So uh, the thing is, during hot working, texture evolution is quite complex because you have slip, which we know obviously uh, causes, causes uh, texture evolution. But we also have, uh, because we're so hot, we've got recovery and maybe ricosylization. Uh, depends who you ask, okay? And some people will get quite heated and say, no, of course not, there's no ricosylization and, and so on. Uh, there's definitely phase transformation. So you can see on the right here, the, the beta approach curve. Um, and what you can see, um, there is that in the range of temperature where the beta, uh, the, the, the phase fraction changes, it's quite steep, right? So if you increase uh, your temperature by 10 degrees or 20 degrees, you can get massive changes in the relative volume fraction and alpha and beta. Uh, and because they have different plasticities and they have different uh, properties that they, inter they will interact differently. So it's really, really quite difficult. Um, and then depending on how fast you cool down, um, you can either get, um, 
secondary precipitation in the beta phase. So you have you have so if you if you're forging in an alpha plus beta phase, you have the alpha phase there in the C of beta usually. Uh, and then as you cool down, if you do it very fast, the beta transforms and forms this kind of a cyclic type structure, you know, um, that you can see here. But in, in practice, when you're forging big components, the cooling rate is never very high. And th what this means is that uh, what, what happens when you cool down is that the, the alpha that is there grows and you have some precipitation as well. So you have both things going on. Um, and what that means is that when you look at the material after forging, you can't really see what was happening during forging, right? You, so may, maybe you can do this for aluminium and so on. You can study the deformation structure. It's really difficult because everything transforms and everything changes. And so it's, you, you can't really see it. Uh, and then not only that, titanium, uh, uh, because of the, 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 um, the thermal conductivity and heat capacity and the goes on adiabatic heating quite easily during, so not only have the temperature increases because of the samples cooling, uh, the, the um, the components cooling during forging, but also deformation heats it up. So you can see all this, all the fluctuations that will be happening during during heating. Um, and it's really difficult to study, like I said. So you know, it's actually a big problem. Uh, but you know, we've been using titanium for 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 a long time, titanium six four, and we're all flying and so on. So you know, we kind of know how to do it. We just don't really know exactly how it all works. Uh, and the one thing that that happens that we know that happens uh, very well is that when um, a bit like steels, there's a crystal graphic relationship uh, between the two phases when they transform from one to the other. Okay, in this case, it's called the Burgers relationship, and you've got this nice alignment um, of the 111 and the 1120, and the, um, and uh, you can you you can control this, and and this this will always happen. So there's a phase transformation. Um, there will always be a kind of this crystal graphic relationship between the alpha and the and the beta phase. Uh, but of course, there's a large number of, of variants, right? Uh, but usually you would mean that uh, if there's a large number of variants, it would mean that if you're going to go a transformation cycle, uh, usually it means that you weaken the texture because for one beta orientation, you end up with many alpha orientations or from one alpha, you end up with many beta and then from many from those many beta, you end up with many alpha. So it should give to rise to randomization. But in practice, uh, we know that sometimes some variants are selected in preference to others. So it's not always true that this, this gives you um, kind of a weakening of the texture. So we can't rely on it. And the other problem that we that we have been relying upon the transformation for weakening the texture and controlling it is that when we heat up the material to high temperatures above the beta transist, grain growth is very rapid, and so you end up with very large beta grains, which which have other other issues, right? Because then the transformation product is coarse, and so on and so on. So sometimes you do not want this. Okay. So the other thing that we have, of course, is crystal is the crystal plasticity, and and uh, you know about this. So we've got the beta phase as BCC, where we have uh, pencil glide and so on. And then on the other side, we've got HCP, uh, which has got um, much less symmetry in the deformation, right? M many fewer easy slip systems. Um, and so that makes the, the um, HCP phase very anisotropic, um, uh, plastically. So all those things are put in together. Um, so what happens, right? So given all this happens, it turns out there is some kind of pattern anyway, right? So if you roll cold, so you're mostly alpha, uh, for example, and we'll use rolling as an example to kind of to, 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 to set the theme. So if you roll cold and you're mostly alpha, then you end up with this single phase texture that you see at the top. So you end up with alignment of the O2 uh, basal poles along the um, uh, normal direction. And then you end up with this alignment along this weaker alignment, but still alignment of the, of the prismatic poles. Um, uh, in the other direction. Okay, that's very characteristic. Um, but if you go hotter, right? So if you're in a dual phase regime, so if you're about around 50-50 or something like that, you the texture changes and the basal poles all of a sudden point in the TD direction. Um, and then you still get some kind of prismatic alignment. Okay. Uh, but the basal poles are now pointing in a different direction. And you see there's some traces of some stuff across the middle as well. Okay, but, but this is very, very characteristic. And this is well known, right? We know that this is what happens. Um, uh, the reason why it happens is perhaps not, not, not very well understood, I would say. So usually what, the way we show that we understand how texture develops is we come up with some crystal plasticity modeling um, and we model the texture evolution and, and we, get, we get the result that we see. So we saw this with Taylor and so on. Um, so here's like a, a summary of the, um, of the um, uh, the modeling work that's been done so far. It's not, it's not everything, but it, these are the kind of the main bits uh, of work that have been done. Uh, 
Uh, and, and you'll notice that all VPSC modeling work. So I've removed um, any kind of Taylor modeling work and so on, because for HCP, the anisotropy is so large uh, that this idea that the Taylor assumption uh, some is, is not very accurate. Even though there are some models out there, people have used Taylor model and so on to predict the texture. So, but I would say we won't need to go to a kind of um, uh, a, a model like the VPSC model to, to, to model the, the texture evolution. Um, and the real reason why you don't see a lot of full field models like crystal plasticity models is that you have this kind of uh, fractal structure where you have alpha and beta and you have beta grains containing alpha structure. So in order to represent that explicitly, it takes quite a lot of computing power. And so it's not been done very often um, in order to, to reproduce the vector structure. Whereas the VPSC, obviously you can put as many grains as you want in there and, and, and play around with grain shape and so on. So um, th th these are the papers that I kind of like the best. So the uh, Ricardo's paper um, uh, with, with uh, Carlos, when he, when he just um, modeled the development um, in zirconium. So you can see this is a texture, like I showed you, this is for zirconium as this is a single phase alpha alloy, and you can see the predictions below here for self-consistent um, and the full constraints Taylor. And you can see that full constraints kind of gives you a, a peak on RD that doesn't exist, and the self-consistent seems to be able to get rid of it and, and gets more or less the right texture and the right alignment of the prismatic. So that seems to work quite well. Um, and you just you just put slip systems in there, and uh, and and, and uh, in some cases twinning, and you get you get the, the right behavior. But dual phase is much more difficult. So uh, Ricardo has another paper just a few years later where he, uh, with Gilles Canova, where he's actually, they've actually tried to model this dual phase texture. Um, and you can remember what we're trying to get is moving the, the pole from the ND to about TD here. This is what the model is trying to do. Um, and when they, when they do it, in order to get this to work, they need to uh, align the alpha and the beta phases so that there's some co-deformation happening in the model. Okay, so if you don't do this, you do not get the right, the right And you also have to elongate your grains so that the beta grains are elongated, et cetera, in order to get the right, the right kind of behavior. Uh, and then you get a little, you get closer with the alpha. So you can see you got some peaks along uh, TD, even though they're very weak uh, in this prediction. Uh, but the beta's wrong, right? The beta texture actually doesn't match what, what we, but the beta texture is, an, is another story. Uh, very recently, um, someone working um, with Marco uh, Knevisic in, 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 uh, in, in the US has, has published this, this bit of work where they seem to get the right texture, right? Well, again, with a self-consistent model. They have also something there called uh, slip transmissibility. Uh, so when the, when, the, when the two phases are well aligned, uh, you, get, you, 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 you seem to ease slip and that seems to help. Unfortunately, this prediction is for about um, 10% beta, which at which point we know it doesn't happen. So the model predicts this, even though there's only 10% beta. So there is something there that's not that's not quite right. Uh, and I have a, a, a quickly done here some some uh, some work by Adam Pilchak on the beta texture, showing that you predict very characteristic kind of BCC uh, type textures. You know, uh, even though there's 50% uh, alpha or 75% alpha, you still that doesn't really change the texture very much in the current predictions if you use the, the VPSC model. Okay, so this is the current understanding. Uh, what I would say is no one's actually been able to model the transition in temperature. So when you go from low volume fractions of beta to, to higher and that transition exactly with the same model, that's, that's, never, that's never happened. And there is no reason why these crystallographic relationships should change with temperature, right? So, um, or ease of slip and so on. There is no particular reason why at a sudden at different temperatures, uh, they should change. So, so I think we don't really understand that is what I'm trying to say. We don't really know exactly what's causing this, this change in texture uh, because our models are not there. Uh, it, experimentally, uh, the work that everyone cites and, and, uh, and it's been there is by Lutering, of course, but there's other work by Inagaki and Sumiatin and so on. And what is interesting is, I mean, every, everyone knows that this is a typical texture that you have in titanium 6 because everyone cites Lutering's paper. But if you look at the other papers, the textures are sometimes quite different. Um, so people uh, do the same rolling and the same rolling experiments and they end up with quite, quite different textures and quite different intensities and so on. And that just goes to show one of the issues that we have in this kind of research topic is that um, measuring texture is quite difficult. It often depends very much on the starting material, on how you actually do the rolling. You know, rolling is a whole process, right? There's kind of all kinds of thermal fluctuations and so on, how you control that, how big your rolls are, how big, and a lot of those details are not passed on and so on. And really we could do with having more good data. Um, and and uh, one of the things that uh, 
I really think we need to try and do better is share the data that we produce in our research programs and so on so that the people that are developing the models have data to go at. So when, when we tried to kind of look at this problem, there was very little data out there that we could use. And a lot of it were just like um, faded, uh, uh, you know, um, pull figures on, on, pay, on PDF papers. And, uh, you know, all this is numerical data. And now we can do better and we should do better. Um, anyway, so, but, but, but that's the section. You can see exactly the, what, what we're trying about. So what, what they also see is that as we increase the temperature, not only you end up with a TD component, uh, being stronger, but you also end up with a texture weakening, okay? So you have this kind of process. So it starts off with in the middle, then you have a TD component, and then, and then of course, if you go to beta, you just get a transformation product. So you get a weak texture. So we are actually, when we started working on this problem, we were working on with, with the people uh, were interested in the nuclear materials, so we working on zirconium to half niobium. And this is our starting material. So we, it had been forged already to try and make the, the beta grain size fairly small. You can probably still see uh, you can see the beta grain size here. Uh, so we just did, did a bit of reconstruction. So you can see the beta in the middle. On the left, we have the alpha EBSD map. Uh, and on the right is an optical micrograph. And you can see that the starting texture is fairly weak, which is quite important because we don't want to start with the texture and then just, we just end up having more of that same texture. So we wanted to, to, to lower that as much as possible. Um, and, and also the other thing that we did is we moved away from the original forger director. So we were far away from that, that starting uh, the, the, the final texture that, that we're trying to understand. And we did a hot rolling study, okay? Um, so here you can see some examples. We did some temperature measurements and so on. But of course, I think you can see we're doing this in the lab. Uh, we'd have, we have to reheat the, the, the sample in between passes because it's a very small sample, it loses heat. Um, and then it reheats about three minutes. Uh, and in this case, we just did it uh, so that uh, we could control the sample, uh, the temperature at the surface of the sample, but we weren't really measuring the temperature in the middle of the sample, et cetera. Uh, and we measured the texture using EBSD and also with, with, with neutron diffraction to just to confirm, especially the, the beta texture. So, so this is what, what we've done. Uh, and then when you look at the texture evolution for, for, and this is what we get. So this is just one, I just picked one temperature. Uh, which is 800 degrees C, which is quite quite hot, where you'd expect this uh, dual phase texture. And sure enough, you can see the dual phase texture developing with a little bit of these bits around the ND, and you get these strong peaks. And ours is, are not actually aligned with TD; they're slightly off. But that's not uncommon. People have seen this in 6.4 as well. Okay, but you can see again prismatic alignment. But the other surprising thing that we saw was that the beta texture became very strong. Okay, so you ended up with a very strong rotated cube component um, in this material. Uh, by the time we got to 87.5%. Uh, and that was quite surprising. We, we weren't expecting to see this at all. Um, uh, and that C is quite different from the predictions from uh, Adam Pilchak. So you can see very strong beta texture and very weak gamma fiber here. So we can summarize when we did, there's many tests, so we can summarize this. But what you can see is that, that here we have the ODF maxima. So essentially like the, the texture strength uh, on the ODF. Uh, and here's the temperature deformation. And what you can see is actually that the picture changes as you increase the amount of reduction. And the biggest changes in texture come out really at large reductions. So that, that I think that was quite interesting. Um, and also we saw this peak in the, in the texture intensity um, for the alpha and the beta, okay? And occurring not exactly the same time, but one just trailing the other, and you can see it here. So, so that was really interesting. You know, Not only we have this kind of peak in texture intensity, and then we have a decrease, uh, but also the, the, the beat is doing something uh, at the same time. So it could suggest that, that those two things are somehow related. The other thing that, that uh, uh, Chris did is he looked at the different texture components uh, and how, how they develop during, during deformation um, and, and what you can see uh, for, for a different alloy. So in this alloy, what we have is, um, is seven and a half niobium, which is, we can roll it more or less the same volume fraction, but when we transform, we can keep the beta phase, okay? So because this material has got more niobium, and niobium is quite sluggish, the transformation doesn't happen on cooling. This means we can actually check the deformed structure on cooling. And in this case, we, we get almost the same results. So we, we develop the TD component, as you can see early, later, and then we develop this uh, rotated cube component at the top. But at large deformations, we start breaking it up again now. So we can see a slight difference from, from the previous results. But overall, the trend is the same, still strong, strong beta texture at the same time as we have a strong alpha texture. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that, that Chris did was quite nice is he picked out different beta conditions and he shows some very rapid changes. So for example, just after 50% reduction, 
some poles of the alpha of the alpha phase completely disappear, right? Just disappear altogether with just 50% reduction. Go from very, very, very strong uh, component for, for all, and for example, all the components along RD seem to disappear very quickly. More quickly perhaps than we'd expect plasticity to, to be able to, to do. Uh, and you know, and then what, what the, we then showed with the material that doesn't transform, the way we can keep the beta is that, so here's the alpha and here's the beta, is that you end up with regions where um, the alpha deforms compatibly with the beta. So you can see in this case, the alpha has more or less, you know, has a small spread because it can deform compatibly with the beta and you have a small spread in the beta. But you also have regions where the alpha is quite, it's got many orientations and that leads to a, um, a kind of, a, a, a misorientation development in the beta as well. So that shows that there is some kind of interaction, right, between the development of the detection of the alpha and in the beta and that, and that they affect each other. Uh, the next thing uh, we did was we took this and we made th some 3D maps of the two phases to try and actually understand the morphology. I mean, when you're trying to see these grains here, it looks like they're breaking up, but you can't really tell their shape and what's, what's happening to them. Uh, but thankfully, we, we had just had one of those uh, Xeon fibs and we, can, we could do a 3D microstructure. And on the left, you've got the alpha, on the right, you've got the beta. And you can see that this is quite nice because you have a region at the top where you have these elongated uh, uh, red grains, which uh, seem to be almost the same orientation. In the middle, there's some different colors, which suggest there's some kind of disturbance of the texture. And they, they are matched by equivalent variations in the orientations in, in the beta. And what what we can do with the studies like this, you can actually extract individual alpha orientation and alpha grains and actually look at their uh, morphology and look at uh, and see it. And what we found is that soft alpha grains, so grains that are aligned well for slip, right? remember alpha is very anisotropic, they are very elongated um, and, uh, and seem to kind of have stretched out like ribbons um, in the material. Uh, and they, they are the ones that contribute into the TD component down here, okay? Whereas when we look for the grains in the middle that are, look like they are breaking up, they, they are in fact breaking up, they're not long ribbons anymore. Um, and you can see that they show quite a lot of misorientation within them um, and quite a lot of, yeah, quite a lot of surgery. So this is, this is some kind of misorientation measurement. So is this, and this is uh, IPF color. Uh, so you can see that there's quite a difference in behavior between the grains that have the O2 along the compression direction and the grains that have the O2 along the TD direction. So, um, we thought, oh, this is this is very interesting. This this suggests that um, there could be something going on between the two phases. But the other thing that we found that was really surprising is that within one of these hard alpha grains, we found uh, uh, an alpha grain from the TD component connected to this uh, to this uh, to the alpha grain of the O2 component. So they, they are very far apart, right? So you can't imagine that um, the green grain or, uh, has deformed into the red grain or vice versa. So they are, they are almost 90 degrees away and they seem to be connected. Um, and you can imagine how if one of these grains deforms quite easily and one of these grains deform more difficultly, and in fact, we could measure a difference in the, in the internal misorientation, there could be a way in which this grain could recrystallize into that other grain. So this providing a mechanism for replacing the grains along O2 with the grains along, uh, along ND with the grains along TD by recrystallization and not deformation. Okay, so it could be. So th this is a possibility. So we cannot rule out recrystallization happening in these materials and giving rise and helping this, this texture change that, that, that we see. Anyway, so that, that, was, that was very nice in zirconium, but really we wanted to do this, see this in titanium because um, there's much less work on zirconium than there is on titanium. Titanium is much more uh, studied. Uh, and, and quite important. And, you know, like I showed you already, there's lots of people interested in trying to understand what's going on uh, in, in titanium and, to, and try to, to control the texture. Um, and and so, so that's what we did. So we set up this consortium between all these companies um, and uh, to, uh, together with Lightform, where we will do some in-situ studies, some lab scale simulations, some computational modeling, um, materials modeling, and just computational modeling with the process as well. Um, and the idea was to, um, to try and get down to these questions. So, you know, things like questions like, is the beta phase always softer than alpha? So often when people assume and try to model the deformation of these materials, they always assume the beta phase is very soft, the alpha is harder. But we've seen in our cases that sometimes in zirconium anyway, the alpha and the beta can deform more or less together, right? So they must be, have the similar strength. Um, but for other orientations, the alpha is harder. So maybe it's subtler than that. So is recrystallization important? So we just saw that in zirconium now recrystallization could be important. 
and this is this happening dynamically or does it happen in between because remember there's all these transients right during processing so is it something that happens during the deformation or just after or is it something that requires a heating and a cooling and so on so there's all those questions that we can ask uh, and so uh, and th that's that's what set off to do so the first thing we we we, we had to get was some material and time at very kindly provided some material uh, and this was, I, I would like to kind of thank Time again, and I do this every time, because all the data that we are producing in this study, all the material, all, all the data, all the code and so on, will be made available to everyone. So we put it up in a repository. And Time at handed over their material uh, without any constraints, and we are allowed to publish all this data and allowed to share all this data. And so we really thank them, uh, because this, I think this is quite powerful and quite, quite useful for, for not just for us, but for the community, okay? And it's a beautiful billet of, of, of titanium 6.4. Um, there's no dimension here, but it's about you know this big, something like that. It's quite, it's quite, quite big. Um, we can cut the many blocks so that we can do a rolling study. We measure the texture at the start of, but you can see the starting microstructure. It's kind of uh, sort of equiaxy, bro broken up alpha lamella equiaxy. But you can see that it's fairly weakly textured. Okay, so they did a good job. So we just took a sample around and, and it, this has already been cogged down. So to try and break up the texture as much as possible. And you can see the textures probably as weak as we can get away with. Um, and then we, Shahan um, uh, went away and did a massive rolling study. Okay, so she started off. Um, so this, this is the beta approach curve. This is how the beta phase changes. And so we wanted to sample uh, the, the kind of different um, beta volume fractions. Uh, and we and perform this rolling schedule. And in addition, what, what Johans did is she actually measured the temperature inside the sample. So we actually now know uh, during the passes more or less what the temperature inside is. So this is different from what Christopher had done before where he only measured the temperature outside. Um, so, and there here you are. So, I mean, there's lots of EBSD results, lots of EBSD data. Uh, this is, um, this is usually you know quite quite hard work these have to be big maps because there is still some micro texture so these are all quite large maps and we're thankful that now we, we can do this in an automatic way we we can put uh something like uh, 12 samples in one go in the microscope and just set it going and so on but they still need to be polished and so on so it's still quite a lot of work but shahan has done a brilliant job and uh we've got all this data set and uh, i'm not gonna kind of take you through all the poll figures i'm just going to point out the most important thing so the first thing to note is that we've got the TD component when we do warm forming of Satan 64, just as we expected. Uh, and that at lower temperatures, there's a little bit more of the ND component. So exa exactly like, like we, we said at the beginning. Uh, and then when we get hotter, so when we get a lot of beta, we start coming, we start getting some long RD. So this means when we're getting hotter, uh, some, of the, some of the alpha texture can must come from the transformation. So this must mean that this RD component only appears when, it, when the beta transforms back down into, into alpha, okay? So that's, that's the main thing. And the, the, the most important thing that we, I would say when we saw all this is that actually um, the starting microstructure is not really a, a lamella microstructure, not really a transformed microstructure. So Shahan then for a, key, for a few temperatures, he repeated the rolling matrix, uh, but after we did a bit, after doing a beta heat treatment. So it's a different starting, uh, microstructure. So here we have a fully beta heat treated microstructure, and you can see that the difference is very small. Okay, so whether we start with a billet material or we do a beta heat treatment on it, the texture that we get at the different temperatures is not very small. Okay, and you can see the main trend here is that uh, you strengthen the TD component as you increase in temperature and you weaken the RD component, but also, and, and I think this is subtle but it's important, the, the alignment of prismatic also decreases with temperature. Okay, so we have less alignment as we do some Anyway, so now I have this beautiful data set, right? And they are big EBSD maps. So we, we haven't studied this yet, but we have access not just to the macro texture, but also to the micro texture. Uh, and not just, we have access, everyone has, has got access. And uh, here's the link anyway, if you want, if you want to get the, de the, the data from, from Zenodo. We can't really measure uh, beta directly with EBSD. Okay, because there's too little bit at room temperature. So what we do is we do a beta reconstruction. So we take, use the Burgers relationship. We separate the transformed alpha. We try to separate it. We try, it's quite difficult. Uh, and then we convert it back, back into beta. Uh, and what was most surprising here is, and like in the zirconium, where we saw a very strong beta texture developing uh, around here, where the alpha texture was stronger. Here, we don't see it until we, are, we do some beta rolling. Okay, and interestingly, 
uh, appear at, after small reductions. So this behavior is not, is not quite expected, okay? Um, it's different, at least different from the zirconium to nap niobium. Uh, and we don't know, uh, the reason why we don't want to shout about this yet and want to publish and so on is because this is made by doing the beta reconstruction. And in particular, at high temperatures uh, and high deformations, uh, the beta reconstruction is actually not very successful. It only reconstructs a very small fraction of the transformed alpha. That's because there's deformation and the transformed alpha is still misoriented and so on. And so it, we don't have a lot of faith in, in, the, in the measurements down here. Okay, so what Sean is doing is doing some synchrotron um, uh, measurements of texture of the beta phase only so that we can, we can extract the beta phase and then we can be sure uh, of what the beta texture is. So don't, don't look at the beta textures too strongly for now. Uh, but anyway, here it is all summarized and you can see how it's different from the zirconium. So on the left, we've got the texture index. Um, we've got, these are all the of Shahan's uh, texture strengths um, predicted. Um, and you can see there's no real big peak. So here's the zirconium, we see a big peak in beta uh, followed after the big peak in alpha. We see maybe a little bump in alpha, you know, in the middle here, a little bump, nothing tremendous, um, but we don't see any big peak in beta. Uh, and, but, but, but the interesting thing is we at the same time tested some different material and that material actually had a much stronger texture, right? At certain conditions. So the starting condition of the material in terms of the starting texture obviously matters quite a lot. Um, so anyway, but that's, that, 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 that's a smaller side. So the issue with doing rolling, it's beautiful. You get lots of data, you get lots of textured data, uh, you get lots of material that you can do further studies on. The problem is the temperature was all over the place. It varied and difficult to control. And it's different as the sample gets thinner because the heat loss is larger and so on. So it creates all this complication. So really we'd like to move to isothermal uh, testing. The problem is you're doing isothermal, you end up having to do things like this, which is the uniaxial compression, which is the worst test that, that anyone can do. They're so difficult to do well. Uh, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot, and even then you can't really do it well because you always end up with a gradient across your material. Uh, and this is particularly bad because they're very small specimens. The gradient across the material, you have the plastic strain is, is different in the middle of them than, than the edges. Then the nominal plastic strain and strain rates that you that you apply are not the same that are experienced by the material and so on. So essentially, you have to model the test if you are to going to use these results. Okay, so so that's what we did. We went away and modeled the result. The benefit is you can do many of these, right? You can do as many as you like, and you can you can change the temperature in a controlled way. You can do, and especially if you have one of these nice uh, extension dilatometers, you can do all kinds of heat treatments during the process. You can hold, you can heat up, you can cool down. It's beautiful. However, you end up with these uh, ugly ducklings of samples because of um, the deformation, and not just because of the, um, of the gradients in, in temperature, but also because um, the, the structural units inside, so the lats and so on, are quite big compared to the size of the specimen. So often you end up with kind of skewed specimens and so on because of the local anisotropy of, of, of the microstructure. Nevertheless, it means you can do quite a, quite a few studies, okay? So, we thought we can't just do rolling because we can't control temperature. Let's see what we can get with hot uniaxial compression. And if we also see a kind of tr uh, uh, a transition in the, in the way the texture uh, evolves with temperature. So like I said, we modeled all this and uh, we, here you can see one example where the middle of the grain actually went over the beta transverse. So it's very easy to reconstruct. And so when we reconstruct on the right, we can really see the, the bit that was hotter and the bit that was cold and how it was squeezed. Um, so yeah, you can, you can actually visually see the, the strain and compare it to, to the model. Um, but we can also measure the texture as a function of position. And we can see that it, it does change because the strain changes. So we have to be careful where we're measuring the texture. Uh, and we, have to, we can then use, we know we don't have to use the nominal strain rates and, and temperatures and, and so on of the test. We can actually know what the temperatures and strain rates and were at the point at which we are measuring. Okay, so that's, that, that, that's quite beneficial. And this is what we see, okay? So this was the starting texture for this particular material. Um, the compression direction was Z, so we were compressing along the O2. And this is what happens. So at lower temperatures, the, this peak splits up a little bit, okay? But kind of stays around there. So it stays along the compression direction. But if you go to the higher temperatures where you develop the TD component, it disappears almost completely. Okay, there's still a little bit left, but a lot of it goes to the TD, to, to the D direction. And the other thing that you notice is we don't have a fiber. Okay, so now this could be because uh, there's not enough statistics and so on, or there's not enough beta grains, but actually that's a common theme. We often see that there isn't really axisymmetric texture um, at, at, 
at the at the end of deformation. And, and, and similar here, the split tends to be along a certain direction. Okay. Uh, and this could be simply because the starting texture is not random and therefore the deformation is not uniaxial, is not uh, axisymmetric. Okay, the, the material sample forms in different directions. So in what the nice thing we were excited about this because it shows that even in compression, you can see the same effect happen, right? This this TD component happening. Um, and the other thing that we found that was quite interesting is that if you increase the strain rate, you tend to strengthen the texture um, a little bit, okay? It's, uh, the alpha texture, but in particular the beta texture. Okay, so the beta texture becomes quite strong uh, when you go to higher strain rates, um, which is quite which is quite an, an, an unexpected. Um, so we wanted to make sure of one thing. So if you read um, uh, Leo's papers and so on on steel and so on, they often show that um, when you do hot deformation of steel and so on, you do a rickettsialization, you often end up with this uh, alignment of the of the cube component along the compression direction with the rotated cube texture development. Uh, and we know that that's a characteristic texture. And, that, and there, it seems to be due to recrystallization. And in that experiment, so if, if you do beta rolling, if you do BCC rolling of, of titanium, you'd expect that the more time you allow for recrystallization to happen, the more of that component you should get and the stronger the, the texture should be. So we did that. We did some beta, beta compression tests just to check what happens. Um, so with, with the two things, with, with the thing with, with hot form is you can vary the temperature in two ways. You can vary the time in two ways. You can do the test fast, or you can do it slower, uh, or you can do and or you can slow cool and fast cool. So there's different ways of controlling the time the, the time resistance. But here's the results anyway. So if we go look to the bottom right first, that's the one that was fast cooling, fast rate, and fast cooling. So that's the best representation of what the microstructure looks like just after deformation. Right? If you don't allow time for recrystallization and so on to happen. And you can see the typical elongated beta grains that, uh, that you'd expect to see uh, after compression. They are been smashed from the top and bottom. This is just a central region. And then you can see on the left that if instead of cooling fast, you slow cool, you start the grain shape starts changing. So you can see real evidence of recrystallization, right? The boundaries start moving and so on. So that's definitely happening. Um, when, when you go to um, slow cooling rate, even if you cool fast, you already have some recrystallization. So this means that some of this can happen dynamically, okay? Because even if you cool very fast, right, right at the end of the deformation, you can still get these quite different shaped grains uh, in your material. And of course, if you do everything very slowly, that's when you get the most extent. And you can see these red grains consuming the blue grains. And that's basically the, this strong component that develops in the in BCC form. So, so this is great, but what this shows is that the lower the strain rate, the more you'd expect this kind of component to develop in crystallization. But what we see in the alpha beta phase is that the higher strain rate, the higher this develops. So it's different. Okay, so what we're trying to say is that even though we always get, um, we know we get this, this texture change and increase in the beta texture in during beta rolling, in the alpha beta, it's slightly different. Okay. So well, the issue that we have here is that we have many grains and we don't know what the starting orientation is. So we can see the final orientation after the test, but we don't know the starting orientation test. So Bernadette's PhD is all about um, make changing this. She, what she did is she heat treats some of our billet materials so that she gets some very big colonies. And the idea there is that we know what the beta orientation is before we even do the test. And we know what the alpha orientation is before you do the test. And then we do a deformation in the dilatometer. And of course, the problem with that is that because of anisotropy, we end up not quite with uniaxial deformation. You can see you can get instabilities and you can get shearing and so on. But nevertheless, you are testing these individual elements and you know what the starting orientation is so you can compare it with the final orientation. Uh, and, and, that's what, and, and, and that's what she's going on to. So here's some results for uh, the test on a single colony. So we've deformed and this, the, the starting orientation uh, of this colony is such that we are deforming along the prismatic plane. Okay, so this is the compression direction here. Um, uh, and so basically from right to left, we're compressing this way. Uh, and you can see what happens to the alpha texture. Because this is a soft component, uh, the alpha texture mostly deforms kind of uniformly. So there's a little bit of rotation going on up and down. You can see it happening. Uh, and actually in some points, right, there are particular pinch points of the microstructure, ends of the laths and so on. You get some dramatic, um, changes in, in orientation, right? So the material can really go far away in, at, at certain points, but only very specific points, okay? Um, but it just shows you, I think, locally, 
how the, the local structure really affects what, 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 what happens locally in, in the deformation. So that's the alpha. And then we look at the beta, and there's a story we were telling. And what we see is that mostly the beta kind of, so this is the starting orientation of the beta. Yeah, sorry if you probably can't see this very well on here on the right. But what happens is it mostly spreads out about that. You can see that. But also there are some points that further away, right? They're not just in this spread of beta that, uh, that, that you'd expect, but they move slightly further away. Uh, and when you look at them in EVSC, when you've identified these points, you can actually see that in between the alpha grains, some of the beta looks to have recrystallized. Okay, so we are. It looks like we have grains that are very far away in orientation, uh, in between the alpha lots. So even though the alpha never disappeared altogether, and there was still alpha there when we did the deformation, this was done at about 50/50 of alpha and beta. Uh, some of beta recrystallization can happen. Okay, so we have evidence of that. And not only that, in the regions where we see a lot of deformation, so the mo the biggest deviation from from the starting orientation. If we look very carefully, we can see new alpha orientations nucleating in the alpha boundaries. Okay, so these are similar to the ones that we saw in Christopher's work in the zirconium in the 3D grain. So there, there's a completely different orientation uh, there, kind of that's nucleated on on this um, on this alpha grain. So uh, and and that orientation th has the Berger's relationship with the deformed beta uh, next to it. So it seems it's what seems to be happening and this is very much conjecture, is that the beta deformation next to the alpha deforms far away from the Bregger's relationship. This means that on cooling, uh, the, the, there's a difficulty in kind of, in growing back the, the alpha into this deformed beta, and instead you nucleate a new alpha grain with a different, very different orientation. So it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a phase transformation happening, right, that creates these kind of little nuclei which maybe in the right conditions could even uh, grow bigger and, and, and cause a texture change. Anyway, so this is very much preliminary work. Uh, Bernadette is now doing many more samples, many different orientations. I just wanted to show this one as well. This is just another orientation that's deformed a bit more uniaxially. Uh, but what was interesting in this one is that even though we are deforming at about 915 degrees, we see some twinning happening in the alpha, okay? Uh, and this is the problem. When you start looking this closely, you see everything happening uh, and then, and then, uh, and then you don't know you don't know what's going on. But actually, we don't see very much. There's very little of it, um, but we definitely see some some of it happening in, in some conditions. Okay, so this is all great. So we now we now kind of we have a method, and and, and Bernadette, what she's going to do now is she's going to look at different orientations and different combinations of alpha and beta to see whether certain orientations, certain combinations of alpha and beta do do different things. Okay, and that's what she's working on right now. But of course, the issue we have with this is that. In the end, we just see the final result, right? We, we do the compression and we take, cut the sample out and we look at it. So we, let's say we saw evidence of recrystallization or let's say we saw evidence of phase transformation. We don't know if it happened during the process or we don't know if it happened just after the process before we actually managed to get the sample out and cut it up. So we actually need the time resolved data uh, because without the time resolved data, we don't even know how to model it. Is it the dynamic process or is it, can we just do the deformation and then do the annealing, right? We, we, we don't know. So this is where uh, Christopher Daniels' work comes in, um, in trying to measure texture in situ during synchrotron tests. So uh, Christopher has been very busy. He's developed all, uh, all sorts of packages for, for analyzing synch synchrotron data, uh, including phase fractions, and including uh, texture reconstruction from incomplete pole figures just from, um, uh, from these uh, fraction profiles. Uh, and and all this all this code and so on is available. So if you're interested and you want to do the same yourself, just get in touch with us, and we'll be very happy to, to share that with you. Uh, so all these pipelines should be quite reproducible, we hope, um, and uh, and all use kind of open source software apart from the Topaz, but but there is an open source alternative to that. All this is open source software, so you should be able to use it uh, whenever you want. So. What experiment do we have? So what's nice is that you go to DAISY, they have a dilatometer just like we have at Manchester, right? So we can just repeat the experiments that we've been doing in the dilatometer, but doing at Manchester, we use our models, et cetera, and we can do different cycles. There's lots of data to go through and I don't have time to go through it all. Uh, the first one I wanted to show you is the 6342, so slightly different alloy, but just because the result is so nice, uh, very preliminary results. So you can see here, we are measuring the texture during a compression test as a strain at the strain rate of, um, uh, I think it's 0.1 in this case per second. Um, and you can see the texture changing. So on the top right here, if you focus on the O2 pole figure, the one that says CD on top of it, 
So this is the end of the test, sorry. There should be something, an indicator saying what strain we are at. But so if we just wait a moment, it'll, it'll start again. So it turns out the certain texture had a peak along the compression direction. And what we see as we compress the sample is that that peak disappears and a new peak appears in the TD direction di uh, directly. So there is no transition from one point to the other. There's just a weakening of that one and a strengthening of that one. And all this same time, uh, the, the beta texture doesn't really change, okay? If anything gets, gets a little bit stronger. So, so that, that's quite exciting. And what's exciting about this one is that in 6246, we quenched afterwards and we can do EBSD. And so we'll, we'll tell you um, what we see in the EBSD and how it, how it matches with what we see in the synchrotron. So here we go, we caught it happening in real time, this transition from the C-axis going from the compression direction to, to, the, to the TD component. The other thing that we get is things, information about uh, how, if the alpha is harder or the beta is harder. So in this case, it's clear that the alpha is harder and the beta is softer. And we can use this data to actually, uh, in, in our models, right? To, 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 to guide our models. Um, the other thing that we did was we actually looked at the effects of, of the of compressing along different directions. And we know we have different amounts of softening depending on, on uh, the temperature we do it at. And that we know that when we have a lot of beta, we actually don't see any softening anymore, okay? So we only see softening at the beginning when you have more alpha. Uh, and what was interesting there is that the texture difference, that the texture evolution is also different, okay? So if you start off, so 950 should be up here. Apologies, I don't know what's happened here during the presentation. So this 950 is the one on the right. This is 910, this is 850. And you can see that whereas the texture strengthens at the higher temperature along TD, it weakens for, for, for the other components, okay? So we see a quite, quite a complete, uh, quite, quite a big difference in the, in the texture evolution. We can capture it in situ and we can see it happening gradually. Uh, and we can do the same for the beta texture. And this, this is quite dramatic because in the beta texture, you can see that if you look at the low temperature data, in this case, we start off with quite a strong texture along the compression direction and it just weakens, okay? Whereas when you go to the high temperature, we actually get a strong a st a strengthening of that of that beta texture. Okay, still alpha there, but higher temperature. So again, the same transition. So we now cut it in situ, uh, and now we can see whether it happens during the deformation, after the deformation, or just before, because we have the timeline at the moment. So down here, you can see when there's heating, holding, heating and holding, and you can see that the behavior for 850 and 910 are quite similar, but it's quite different at the higher temperature. Okay, so there's something that's very different. And a lot of it happens during deformation and just after. Okay, so it's deformation and just after, that's where, where all, the, all the tricks happen, but mostly during deformation. So this process, whatever's happening, if it is reconciliation and so on, it's happening dynamically because you can see it's happening during the deformation stage and not afterwards. Um, so there you go. So just I'm just coming to the end. So I just want to show you very briefly our modeling work. So in order to understand these results, what we're doing is we're taking these kind of experiments and we're creating synthetic simulations using Damask and doing crystal plasticity simulations. So at first, we're going to try to see how far we can get with the crystal plasticity alone and see if we get there or not. Uh, and you can see uh, on the top, there's the experimental results. On the bottom, you can see we've taken a look at that section and we've deformed it. And we can see how the spread compares to the spread that we see experimentally. We see we don't see these, these big kind of um, misorientations from, from the, of the O2 because we certainly don't have the same kind of extreme shapes that we have in, in reality, but also the spread um, in the alpha looks slightly, the spread in the beta looks slightly different. Ours is more kind of isotropic, whereas in the beta, it clearly uh, moves in a certain direction. Uh, but you can see things like, for example, you can see that the, the slip in the beta is certainly much higher than in the alpha. Uh, and that could explain some of the reasons, some of the, some of the effects we see in terms of, of, of transformation and some of the observations that Bernadette saw. So the next step, is then to include other bits, like right? the non-plasticity effects that we think are important. Because at the moment, we could, we could almost argue anything is important, but what we want is the relative importance. We need to understand exactly how much oxidation is important, when does it become important, when does it need to come into the model? So what we want to do is to combine some kind of texture evolution, uh, some kind of um, recovery and recrystallization modeling uh, to happen. Um, and we know now it has to be done dynamically, okay? But first of all, we're, we're doing it statically. So we're doing deformation and then trying a recrystallization. And then the next bit is to couple the crystal plasticity with phase field model using that mask. Okay, and we'll have this coupled model uh, that, that can then do uh, small steps uh, for, for, for small volumes, obviously, for this, that kind of experiment that we were just looking at. So here's some initial results. And here's a very low volume fraction of alpha. 
but you can see, and, and we're deforming the, the volumes in shear, and you can see that depending on whether you have a, a soft alpha or a hard alpha, you develop different dislocation densities because there's different mismatch between the two phases. And then at the moment, we can do kind of simple approaches where we look at the flow, the vomesis stress, and we, we estimate a, a dislocation density, ignoring, uh, ignoring um, recovery, for example. Uh, and then what we can then do is take this dislocation density and create a, a subcell or a subgrain distribution, something like this, okay, where the subcell diameter uh, is given by the dislocation density. And then we can then link it in with the, the phase field modeling and allow the, the grain boundaries to actually move and the microstructure to evolve, okay? So we can actually see what happens to the, to the, um, the microstructure. Uh, during annealing. And I don't know if this is what we should be working previous. Oh, there you go. So show it to you again. So not, not much happened in this case, but you can actually, so depending on what mobilities and so on. And in the end, this is not going to be the basis of our predictive tool, but it's going to be the basis that lets us understand to what extent uh, the recrystallization or phase transformation and so on can matter because we can put in realistic mobilities and realistic um, uh, uh, activation energies for the different processes and see how they kind of compete with each other to, in order to, to, to change the texture. And then we can just bring that into the, to the more microscopic models. At the moment, I think we still need this kind of understanding that, that, that we don't have. Um, so there you go. So the last thing, this is my last slide, is just to say that all this data and all this software uh, that we are producing in Lightform is gonna be openly available. So uh, we're actually collaborating with the, with the, the Royce Institute in Manchester to kind of populate their database. Uh, you can already find our data on Zenodo um, and, uh, and all our analysis data or simulation codes and so on, they will all be available and openly available for you to use and to improve on. And then so we can use them again when they're better. Okay, um, and I think that's all. So I just, just very quickly my conclusion. So the texture evolution depends strongly on temperature and starting microstructure and we don't, can't really predict it yet. We need, and we need to do better so that we know what to control in the process. and. You know, if you're a customer, what you need to tell your the your, the person that's making your titanium to do so that they get they get the right the right microstructure and the right texture. So plasticity dominates at lower temperatures, but at higher temperatures, recrystallization seems to play a role. There's lots of little bits of evidence, um, and the synchrotron suggests that it happens during deformation. Okay, so it's dynamic or metadynamic, as some people like to call it. So it happens just just after. Um, and the other thing that there is strong evidence that the deformation development, the alpha and the beta, are linked. So you saw those examples of um, where there's transformation mediated recrystallization, so where you get uh, bits, of, um, bits of the alpha nucleating in, in the old alpha, they've got quite a different relationship, but they're related to, to the beta. Uh, and I think that this is quite interesting because if there is this relationship, not only we, could, we can be closer to explaining the macro texture, but also why sometimes, and I didn't show you any maps of Shahan's measurements, but you can really see that with increasing deformation, you often end up with stronger micro textures as well as macro textures. So locally, there is some kind of alignment of, of the alpha and, and the beta. So, you, so that the, those, those uh, macro zones that are so important for the TAM64 could also be due to the fact that there's this kind of uh, co-deformation of, of, of the two phases. So anyway, that's it. That's, that's, the, that's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I went, I went for a whole hour. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for a very lovely presentation. I think I can stop the recording here.